Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to start part four of my series on the selected gross pathology of the dog. And we're going to focus on pathology of the GI tract, particularly the GI tube. We're going to cover lesions of the liver and the pancreas, also part of the GI tract, in a separate lecture. If you're interested in GI pathology, I would direct you to a series of lectures that I put together last year on GI pathology in all domestic species, which are available through the JPC's video library or the Foundation's YouTube channel. As we do at the beginning of every lecture, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who over years have provided me such great images, either directly or through online collections, which allow me to put these lectures together. Let's start with a lesion that's seen in the mouth of young dogs, usually less than three years of age. These whitish cauliflower growths on the oral mucosa and the gingiva represent infection by canine papillomavirus. The same virus also causes tumors in the skin and inverted papillomas. Usually these lesions spontaneously regress in a period of about four months. They have a latency period of about two months. They regress usually about two months later. The virus infects the basal cells of the skin causing proliferation. Then viral genome replicates in the cells of the stratum spinosum and the granular cell layer, which, where it occasionally forms a very interesting and characteristic histologic feature, the coilocyte, large grayish blue cells due to an accumulation of cytokeratin in their uh, cytoplasm. And if you're really lucky, you may find viral inclusions in some of these coilocytes. Viral assembly occurs in the squamous layers of the epithelium. Another lesion that may be seen in young dogs, especially puppy, is enamel hypoplasia. Look closely and you will see the defects in the enamel, which are the result generally of viral infection in utero during the time which the teeth are developing. Some people say, no, it's not viral infection, it's just any fever that the dam gets during this time period. But it's most often associated with canine distemper virus. And what happens is the virus causes degeneration and necrosis of the enamel organ, especially the stratum intermedium, which is interposited between the inner and outer layers of the enamel epithelium. And if you damage it, then connective tissue can touch the enamel that's been produced and it will be resorbed or covered with dentin. Now, because enamel deposition on the developing tooth takes a while, a lot of times um, the animal will clear the infection and then the enamel organ will reform properly and much of the crown will have enamel put on it. Don't confuse this with tetracycline administration, which gives you a discoloration of the teeth, but not this pitting and lack of formation of the enamel. It's usually a bilaterally symmetrical lesion, and you can also see this with BVD in the calf. Let's look at the tongue, particularly the underside of the tongue, and in animals in renal failure with, with high levels of circulating uh, blood urea and nitrogen, you will often see ulcers on the underneath side of the tongue. And the reason that this happens is when the BUN gets so high, it, the urea will exude through the mucosa and will be concentrated in the saliva, which accumulates in the bottom of the mouth, essentially turning it into a caustic ammonia bath. And because the tongue is sitting down in that, you will get these caustic burns and ulcers on the bottom of the tongue. Now, another lesion that's not quite as well known that's also seen in uremia is infarction of the tip of the tongue. Here we have a, a distinct loss of color due to a loss of vascularity, hemorrhage, and probably some inflammatory cells at the outer point. And one of the things that high levels of 
of urea nitrogen will do is damage endothelium. And oftentimes it will damage the endothelium of the end arteries of the tip of the tongue resulting in thrombosis and infarction of the tongue. If you flip this tongue over, you might also have those ulcers on the other side. Uh, if the animal survived, and that's pretty uncommon because these animals are in chronic renal failure, they often have uh, damage and mineralization in other organs such as the stomach and the kidney, uh, of course, and the lung, um, they don't generally survive. But if they do, these animals may slough the end of their tongue and, and drive right along. Here's a large swelling underneath the tongue of a dog. This is a sublingual mucosal, which is damage to the duct of a uh, salivary gland, often the sublingual or the mandibular salivary glands give rise to these. And when the mucosal is underneath the tongue, it's called by a special name, and that's a ranula. These are most often seen uh, in animals that perhaps have been chewing on foreign material like sticks and poke themselves down there. Um, or bite wounds from other animals and have been seen in people who use uh, choke collars, especially those with the little points on them and they pull real hard, hard enough to do damage to the soft tissues of the cervical region. Here's another great lesion of the tongue, a picture when you want to use all the information that's available to you, and you notice that this is either a Alaskan Malamute or a Husky. And the sled dogs um, get a specific lesion of the tongue known as an eosinophilic granuloma. Uh, the name is very descriptive what you see there's a lesion that we see a lot more commonly in cats but in the dog it's sort of restricted to the sled dog breeds and and it's interesting whenever you get a lot of eosinophils together which under the microscope have bright red crystals when you get them together in tissue they the tissue takes sort of a greenish color there's a lot of inflammation in this lesion collagen degradation is a characteristic feature in uh, in this lesion so you have a mixture of eosinophils collagen degradation and lots of macrophages it looks a bit like the linear granuloma in the cat sometimes they're not quite so prolific. sometimes they may be a shallow ulcer you can see them on the soft palate and in the back of the throat itself and one of your important morphologic uh or differentials for this is going to be a lingual mast cell tumor. Yes, we see mast cell tumors on the tongue of dogs as well. They're often accompanied by lots of eosinophils. So make sure when you see something like this that you think about mast cell tumor. But in these sled dogs, it's almost always going to be eosinophilic granuloma of the tongue. Okay, this is a congenital lesion. You can you notice that the proximal part of the esophagus, proximal to the base of the heart, is very distended. This is a form of congenital megasophagus. And if you if you watch the first lecture on cardiovascular pathology, I said we would come back to talk about the ligamentum arteriosum. Uh, during development, there is a vessel that joins the pulmonary artery and the aorta. It's called the ductus arteriosus and normally at birth it, it slams shut um, and there's no crosstalk between the pulmonary artery and the aorta and eventually it becomes a small fibrous band called the ligamentum arteriosum and in the vast vast majority of cases it is never heard from again but in a number of cases in animals you have an abnormality in development in which the aorta comes in from the right side. If we're looking, if we're looking at the nose of the animal, stay with me on this, okay? Normally the aorta, if the animal's standing on his feet, normally the aorta comes on the down on the left side of the heart. It's the left aortic arch and the right aortic arch which is there in, uh, uh, in the developing fetus, 
disappears. Okay, in a condition uh, which is known as a persistent right aortic arch, the aorta comes in from the right side. And what it does is it twists and pulls that ligamentum arteriosum ac tightly across the top of the esophagus. And the esophagus essentially has a vascular ring. I sort of prefer the term vascular ring anomaly with megasophagus for this lesion because then I don't have to go into this long explanation of what a persistent right aortic arch is. But now you know and uh, you can decide whether you want to call the, these persistent right aortic arches or vascular ring anomalies. But so the, the aorta, come, aorta comes in for the right and it twists everything and it pulls that ligamentum arteriosum into the uh, esophagus where it forms a band with the aorta on top, the pulmonary artery on the other side, and it constricts the esophagus, which fills with food. This is a congenital form of megasophagus. And normally the esophagus posterior to the heart is pretty normal. Okay, now there are other forms of megasophagus in dogs. I should mention, since we're here, there are acquired forms. And those come from, there's only one congenital form, which we talked about, the, but the acquired forms come in many different flavors for many different reasons, including myasthenia gravis, where antibodies are directed against the acetylcholine receptors um, of the esophageal muscle polymyositis, hypothyroidism, which leads to denervation and muscle atrophy, uh, heavy metal toxicity, such as lead, which also results in denervation, thallium poisoning, uh, Addison's disease, Chagas disease, recurrent esophagitis, recurrent gastro, uh, gastric dilatation bovis. So lots of causes of acquired megasophagus, which occurs late in life but only one cause in young puppies, such as this. There are a couple of breeds which get a congenital idiopathic megasophagus, which have never been linked to anything, including Great Danes and Irish Setters and German uh, Shepherd Dogs. And it's thought to perhaps be a defect in the recognition of esophageal distension, but nobody knows all that much about it. So megasophagus, congenital due to a vascular ring anomaly here, but there are many also, also many causes of acquired megasophagus in the dog. Now here's an absolutely fantastic lesion of a granuloma in the esophagus. And this is the result of the migration pattern of a parasite known as Spirocerca lupi. They're big red worms and you can see a couple of them coursing through this granuloma. Now, for this particular parasite, dung beetles or cockroaches are intermediate hosts, but chickens and reptiles and rodents can act as peritonic hosts. And what happens when the dog eats the beetle or the cockroach or one of the peritonic hosts? The larval forms of this large nematode migrate through the stomach wall and up through the aortic uh, submucosa and adventitia so they get to the esophagus and they burrow into the wall the female forms a large granuloma she's able to stick her tail out when she goes to lay her eggs and they're passed into the gi tract where the uh, they go out and the cycle begins again now this big granuloma in the wall of the esophagus can't be good it must be difficult to swallow around but there are a lot of other lesions that you may see in animals infected with spirocerca lupi beyond simply this granuloma uh, you may see lesions anywhere in the body uh, even in the urinary system due to aberrant migration of these particular parasites. The presence of this large granuloma or another type of mass that we'll see in a minute may result in hypertrophic osteopathy or proliferative bone of the distal legs, the metatarsals and the metacarpals, occasionally the digits. So we're gonna look at that when we get to orthopedic, but any mass in the chest may do something like that. You often will see 
uh, spondylosis deformans of the ventral vertebral bodies overlying these particular lesions. And one other lesion that it may cause is this granuloma may turn into a large neoplasm. It may become a sarcoma of the esophagus or of the aorta in this area. So a lot of things go on with Spirocerca lupi. It's a uh, ubiquitous global parasite, more commonly seen in hotter, more humid regions of the globe. Okay, if you've dealt with large breed dogs, and, and we see this on a very regular basis at the Joint Pathology Center because of the large number of German Shepherds and Belgian Malinois and, and large deep-chested breeds that uh, are, are used in the military, but you can see that the stomach has twisted. This is gastric dilatation volvulus. Okay, You can also see that the spleen is now in the right cranial quadrant and it has flipped and greatly uh, enlarged due to venous infarction. As a matter of fact, all of the organs of the body or of the abdomen are in uh, different or difficult places. And what happens, let's go back to looking at the front end of the animal again, looking at the nose. What happens is that the stomach will twist in a clockwise direction. And so the spleen is dragged from this side over to this side. You have a twist and uh, a diminished blood supply or perhaps even infarction to many organs of the abdomen, including the pancreas, including the kidney. Um, and then obviously the animal is unable to pass ingesta because the esophagus is twisted. It cannot vomit and you'll have a tremendous accumulation of gas. Um, at the same time, the lack of circulation to the wall of the stomach is causing necrosis of the mucosa and the wall. How does this happen? There's no one particular way, but things that you often see in the clinical history are repeated episodes of simple dilation, which stretches the gastropatic ligament and gives the animal the ability to twist a stomach. Uh, possibly postprandial exercise and overfeeding may contribute. And often you will see um, a diet that has a somewhat high level of fat in it. Um, it's also been seen in animals with uh, pancreatic atrophy who have difficulty processing fat, such as uh, certain German shepherds and collies as well. Um, death in these animals can occur from a number of, of things. Uh, compression of the lungs and inability to expand the lungs certainly is a problem. Uh, acid base imbalance, shock, and the release of myocardial depressant factors from the pancreas all contribute to this emerging and urgent disease. The uh, Interestingly, the, the United States Army over the years has gone to the practice of gastropexy to try to reduce the amount of gastric dilatation volvulus, and it has reduced the overall numbers of stomach twists in military working dogs. Just another picture, massively enlarged stomach, and this uh, spleen, a nice picture of it up in the right upper quadrant up against the diaphragm. Now, when you untwist these, sometimes, if you've done this surgery, sometimes you get to it quickly, and you look at it, and you untwist it, and you hope that it gets nice and pink again. But there are a number of these cases in which, even though everything looks good at surgery, you end up with infarction, often at the, uh, the pyloric edge. And that may not become apparent until after surgery. Other things that will 
give you this characteristic pattern. One is uremia. This is a very common area where in uremia you will get uh, mineralization of the gastric mucosa, uh, thrombosis of vessels. Remember, high levels of BUN uh, will whack the endothelium, resulting in hemorrhage. So that's always a when I see this particular pattern of hemorrhage, um, I'm thinking maybe repair GDV or uremia. Here's an absolutely great picture by Laura Bryan from Texas A&M. And this is another way the stomach gets into trouble. And this is known as a gastroesophageal hernia or gastric inversion, where the stomach actually goes up into the esophagus. This is usually seen in young dogs, often German Shepherd dogs, and it's never been proven um, but it's thought that maybe pre-existing esophageal disease um, is the cause of this. This is usually fatal. Only a couple of dogs have ever been reported to survive longer than a week with this particular condition. Now we talked about um, hemorrhage within the stomach and mineralization as a result of uremia. This is a great section of a stomach of a dog in chronic renal failure. And you can see the areas of hemorrhage, especially in the pylorus. Look at these little white areas. And these are areas of mineralization. And when you cut through this, um, you can see that it is the middle of the gastric mucosa that is heavily mineralized. Okay, very characteristic. And if you're having trouble making this gross diagnosis, a tip is to take this piece of stomach, cut off a piece of stomach, and put it in the refrigerator for about two hours. Yeah, it doesn't even have to be two hours, probably 20 minutes is enough. And then come back, and that will help you feel the grittiness, almost like Rice Krispies, um, or, shit, or that packing material with the bubbles, and you'll feel the mineral a lot easier. Um, you have, because the hemorrhage, this represents necrosis and dystrophic calcification of the gastric mucosa. Uh, you'll see atrophy of glands in this area with fibrosis. If you're very lucky, you may actually see submucosal arterial necrosis and thrombosis. Now, we talked about when urea nitrogen gets high in the blood and things it does, including at the, uh, the endothelium. This is another aspect of uremia. It's not due to high BUN. So I shouldn't say it's uremia. It's really due to chronic renal failure. And this is due to phosphorus retention. When you take an animal's with chronic renal failure, if you take your calcium value, multiply it by your phosphorus value, and it's higher than 70, you start to get mineralization. You get mineralization here in the stomach. You get mineralization of the alveolar wall, of the intercostal musculature, of the uh, basement membranes of the glomeruli and, and Bowman's capsule. So calcium by phosphorus is is over 70. The majority of cases, that's going to be because your phosphorus is high. As you lose mass of the kidney, uh, you need a fully functional kidney to excrete phosphorus. If you have very little kidney left, you retain phosphorus, and that number goes up significantly. There are far fewer cases in which that uh, elevation to 70 is the result of calcium, possibly vitamin D or vitamin D analogs may do something like that. That's much less common than animals in chronic renal failure. Oh, here's an absolutely fantastic picture by Dr. Paul Stromberg. And it shows a couple of things going on in this stomach. Here is the pyloric stomach, the pylorus here, and the small intestine. Now, the first thing that we're gonna see is we're gonna see these large polyps. This is a condition which has been called hypertrophic antritis. Um, and you get initially a proliferation of the 
uh, mucosa of the pylorus, and then you will get this proliferation of the mucosa. It's most commonly seen in small breed dogs, and as you can imagine, it can cause pyloric obstruction and retention of stomach acid. And then right in front of this, we see these very large rugae. Now, there are some conditions which are very rare in dogs that can cause large rugae or rugal hypertrophy, including Menetrier's disease, which we see in, in the bee dogs, Basenji's, Beagles, Boxers, and Bull Terriers. And we see it in humans, but that's usually associated with some inflammation and protein loss. In this particular animal, these large rugae are the result of retention of gastric acid, impaired outflow, and the rugae will hypertrophy in any area where it can't move the acid along because they're covered with mucous neck cells. The stomach senses it needs extra protection, and the rugae become big. You also see big rugae uh, in areas of, for example, in areas of previous surgery or gastropexy where motility is somewhat impaired, so you get rugal, hy rugal hypertrophy. So when you see enlarged rugae, look for outflow ab abnormalities or local stasis before you start thinking about uh, uh, rare conditions such as Menetrier's disease. You can also see a rugal hypertrophy in cases of Zollinger Ellison, gastrin secreting pancreatic tumors, which cause an increased production of acid in the stomach, and the stomach is going to respond over time by increasing the size of the rugae to try and offset with the mucous neck cells that excess acid. So rugal hypertrophy, think of alpha obstruction, and in this picture, you know exactly why. Gastric ulceration in the dog almost always occurs at the pyloric stomach, which has blood vessels that run very close to the surface, but more importantly is where the acid of the stomach and the uh, uh, basic nature of the contents of the intestine collide, and you almost always see it there. This particular vasculature also appears to be very flimsy and weak and needs a constant influx of prostaglandins to maintain patent, particularly prostaglandins E2 and I2. So things that will suppress those prostaglandins, such as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, will cause pyloric ulceration, in this case, pyloric perforation. Steroids will do it too. They decrease the prostaglandins. They also decrease the protective phospholipid productions of the stomach, as well as bicarbonate secretion in the small intestine. They also decrease tissue plasminogen uh, inhibitors, which cause coagulative defects and vasoconstriction in this area. So steroids are a major cause of gastric ulceration as well. We've all heard about mast cell tumors causing gastric ulceration, and that's the result of histamine production. And histamine binds to receptors on parietal cells in the stomach, increasing acid secretion. Other things that will cause it will be, for example, that Zollinger Ellison syndrome I just mentioned, which is a gastrin secreting tumor, also a substance which upregulates the production of acid, sort of overwhelms the mucosa in this particular area. Hepatic disease may be a cause of ulceration, but there is no apparent reason for this, at least in this particular moment. So things that will do it, that will cause lesions right here. Let's remember, steroids, non-steroidals, mast cell tumors, and pancreatic tumors that secrete gastrin. Oh, here's a wonderful picture of a red intestine and, and William's rule of red guts, number one, in the dog and the cat. Until proven otherwise, it's a parvovirus. Canine parvovirus type 2 in the dog 
and panleukopenia virus in the cat. Both of them cause a necrohemorrhagic enteritis in dogs and cats. Um, if the animal is less than two weeks of age, you may see infection in multiple tissues. We've seen in the first lecture the devastating effect it can have in the heart in animals of all ages. You will see lymphocytolysis, bone marrow depression, and because canine parvovirus is a replication deficient virus, it needs a lot of cells, a concentration of cells in a particular stage of the cell cycle to infect. So as the animal gets older, infection with canine parvovirus is restricted to certain organs that turn over very quickly, the intestine obviously being one. Um, today, we don't see the, the amount of parvovirus since we do vaccinate for it, but it appears that the black and tan dogs like Rottweilers and Dobermans are predisposed and inordinate number of cases turn up in those particular breeds. A lot of things that will cause death in animals with parvoviral enteritis. Uh, one is the fact that the virus affects the crypts, and so the intestine doesn't really have the ability to regenerate. A second thing is to, there is this necrohemorrhagic uh, enteritis, and endotoxin almost has direct uh, entry into the blood. So a lot of these animals die of endotoxemia. The lesions concentrate in the intestine. You will have some infection in the dog, in the, in the cecum and colon. Don't see that in a cat. With panleukopenia, it pretty much stops with the intestine. There are a lot of animals that don't develop clinical disease um, with parvovirus. Uh, most of the ones that we see now are animals that did not receive maternal antibodies and ultimately later in life may develop parvovirus. A great lesion um, on top of this, we didn't open up this gut, this gut was, was taken, but if you see this cobblestone or ground glass appearance, it's a covering of fiber that you see commonly in inflamed gut for any particular reason. And if there's an area of the gut in this animal that is not affected, it's going to be the normal, smooth, shiny translucent appearance of normal gut, not this sort of cobblestone ground glass appearance. That's a dead giveaway that there's inflammation going on in this section of gut. Another classic lesion. Now this is an, a gut that is not extremely hemorrhagic, but you can see the fibrinonecrotic membrane. This is dead mucosa. But I want you to take a look at these craters in the mucosa. And these were Peyer's patches. And even before the mucosa becomes necrotic, parvovirus will infect the uh, div rapidly dividing cells of the lymphoid organs, resulting in marked lymphocytolysis. So you'll see a Peyer's patch necrosis. Um, you'll also see necrosis in the bone marrow. Granulocytes are most susceptible. Megakaryocytes are the last one to go. And the infection of T lymphocytes is a major way that this virus gets around the body. Okay, an uncommon lesion that we have to give a differential for is um, this particular lesion. You can see the original outline of the mucosa of the, not the mucosa, the entire uh, intestine here, and it has been replaced by a cellular infiltrate, cells in such massive numbers that you can't really recognize the intestine anymore. It's no longer red, it is white because of the number of cells, and these cells actually have gone beyond the border of the intestinal serosa into the surrounding tissue. This is what is seen in dogs with enteric infection, with pythium or fungal enteritis, such as histoplasma or blastomycosis. This is a diffuse 
severe granulomatous enteritis. You can see the mucosa is sort of sloughed and necrotic. The only differential that I would have beyond pythium or fungal enteritis would be something like lymphoma, but that's not a good one because lymphoma never leaves the, uh, never, never reaches out into the surrounding tissue like this. So great case of pythium, about 33% of dogs or animals, I should say, with, with, uh, with pythiosis, get intestinal pythiosis, and it's probably best documented in the dog. Um, if you see pythium in the gut or in the skin, you're really looking at a couple of different organisms. It is impossible to be able to tell pythium on, uh, uh, on histologic examination, even with silver stains, uh, versus uh, the various zygomycetes, the fungi of the zygomyces family, or a new one, legenitum. Um, and this is something that has to be done by culture, or by PCR. So generally when I see these, I just list those three. And if people want to pursue uh, advanced diagnostics um, for academic purposes, that's perfectly fine. But uh, I've been burned when I've said it was zygomyces and it was pythium or, and vice versa. So be careful there. Oh, here's a wonderful picture. And these pictures are generally of this lesion are generally taken underwater so we can see all the villi free floating. And all the villi are white because the lymphatic in the center of them, the lacteal, is full of chyle. And this is a condition that is known as lymphangiectation. If you turn this piece of gut over, you will see that there will be granulomas. The lymphatics will be outlined by the same white tissue, and then studded along them will be large granulomatous nodules, a granulomatous lymphangitis. Um, so this is lymphangiectasia. It is one of the most commonly reported causes of protein-losing enteropathy, and it's seen in certain species, including the soft-coated Wheaton Terrier, Yorkshire Terriers, and Norwegian Lundhunds um, as breed predilections. The animals have a lot of clinical signs as a result of this uh, impaired digestion and protein loss, including, of course, hypoproteinemia, ascites, lymphopenia, diarrhea, steatorrhea, hypocholesterolemia, and hypocalcemia. A lot of these are due to the result of the severe hypoproteinemia that's associated with this particular lesion. Rarely you can see this um, due to obstruction of lymphatics by granulomas or neoplastic disease, but usually it is this disease of uh, lymphangiectasia. Here's a lesion that you'll see in dogs with chronic diarrhea or dogs with a vitamin E deficient diet with concomitant high levels of uh, unsaturated fatty acids. And this disease has been called many names over the years. The first one was the simplest one, the one that I remember. And we call this brown dog gut. That makes sense. Um, and you would be surprised uh, the lesion is actually the accumulation of seroid. Used to be lip used to be called lipofusin, but it's an abnormal pigment. So lipofusin is a normal wear and tear pigment. This is an abnormal pigment, so we call it seroid. This is the new name for this lesion is intestinal seroidosis. Although you might have called heard it called intestinal lipofusinosis, or back in the day, just after brown dog gut, it was called intestinal lyomyo metaplasia. And the seroid pigment accumulates within the smooth muscle cells of the gut wall. You'd be surprised when you look at these that are incredibly brown and you look in and, and you'll see the pigment, you'll see the seroid pigment on either end of the nucleus of the affected cells, but it just doesn't seem enough to cause this really gross brown color. Um, you can see it in any animal with diarrhea, chronic enteritis, pancreatitis, and it can be prevented by supplementation with vitamin E. 
um, can also be seen as one of a range of lesions in cocker spaniels with generalized seroid lipofusinosis, but those animals also get neurologic disease as well. So this is intestinal seroidosis. Uh, did you think that you were going to get to forget about parasites uh, once you got out of vet school? Well, pathologists deal with a lot of parasites, so you need to go back and, and review these. There are two different parasites in the gut of this dog. Now, the first thing that I want you to notice is how happy and healthy and pink this gut looks. They're not causing really any problem. There are actually probably three um, this uh, segmented cestode is Dipalidium caninum, a common uh, cestode of the uh, GI tract, which is transmitted by fleas, not flea bites, but the dog has to actually swallow the flea, digest the flea, and then the dipalidium will be released and then can live in the dog for a long time. This may be another tapeworm. I'm not exactly sure, but I know this one. And these segments will break off and be passed in the feces where they become infective to other animals. Also in here, we have a large ascarid. Okay, Ascarids and cestodes don't attach to the mucosa. They don't suck blood. They just sort of live on whatever's in there at the time. Most of ascarids will be found proximally in the GI tract. They seem to like the duodenum. Um, and Toxicara canis, Toxicara cati uh, in the cat. And Toxicara leonina will affect both dogs and cats. Don't forget that uh, um, probably the most uh, pathogenic part of the life cycle of ascarids is the migration of the third stage larva, larva where they uh, migrate into and through the lungs. They may cause an eosinophilic pneumonia, they, a low-grade pneumonia during this uh, a period. Eventually, they migrate up to the trachea to be swallowed where they mature to adults within the GI tract. Um, we do see in some species both cutaneous forms and, and ocular forms of larval migrans um, and other forms of visceral larval migrans. Toxicare will do it, usually doesn't cause too much of a problem. The one you have to worry about is the raccoon ascarid balus ascaris because it is a prolonged migration of very large uh, larvae which have a tropism for the brain in the dog and the cat and unfortunately in people as well. Now compare and contrast that particular mucosa with this one, which looks sort of yellowish and pale because this animal is very anemic. And we can see the culprit right here, this curved worm with its head in the mucosa. And this is, of course, a hookworm, Ancelostoma caninum or Ancelostoma brasiliense or uh, in the far north, uh, maybe Uncinaria stenocephala. But uh, these are, are bad actors, and they result in microcytic hypochromic anemia due to iron deficiency. These hookworms can ingest up to uh, a hundredth to two tenths, depending on their size, on how much blood is available uh, of blood per day. That's 0.2 mLs. And so uh, young pups with a couple hundred worms may lose up to 30% of their blood volume in a single day. So we do see acutely fatal cases of hookworm disease in pups two to three weeks of age. The hookworms get to them through the mother's milk. They, uh, in the mother, they become dormant in the skeletal muscle. And then uh, when the mother becomes pregnant, they can be passed through the milk and uh, infect young animals, resulting in, in mortality in unwormed puppies. Another parasite usually that hangs out in the cecum or the colon are whipworms or Trichurus vulpus. And although this gut looks very red 
and inflamed. There's no blood loss here. These aren't parasites. They do result in ulceration mucosa, maybe a little leakage of blood, but they're not blood suckers like hookworms. One thing that they will do is in, that in these large infections, they cause a lot of irritation and they may result in indecisception. A heavy colonic infestation may also result in diarrhea and ill thrift, but uh, um, they do not cause the systemic problems that we see in hookworms. But nobody wants a, a indecisception like that due to whipworms. They also may result in symptoms of uh, Addisonian disease um, due to an aberration in the sodium potassium ratio. So, so they're one of the, the false causes of that uh, low sodium potassium value. We talked about intussusception. This is an absolutely fantastic picture um, of an intussusception. And you can see that one part of the intestine has invaginated within another, which is covering it. If you like uh, the, the big words, this is the intussusciens, the receiving part. This is the intussusceptum, which is inside. Now, if you take this and try to pull it apart, it's going to be very difficult because of the swelling here. Don't forget that you can get intussusceptions um, post-mortem. If you've ever seen an animal that's recently killed and you open up the abdomen real quick, you will notice that the GI tract is moving for a couple of minutes, and you can get intussusceptions that are post-mortem. The difference is that you don't have the swelling. They reduce very easily when you pull the two ends. And in a real intussusception, it's going to be a lot more difficult um, to pull the, the intussusceptum out of the intussuscipians. What causes uh, intussusceptions? We just saw whipworms, but essentially anything can cause an intussusception. It's the result of irritability and a little bit of hypermotility. So anything from handling the guts to roughly during surgery to enteritis to lymphoid hyperplasia, foreign bodies, uh, any of these can, can result in, it, in a somewhat irritable gut and an intussusception. The most common site in the dog generally is the ileocecal valve, just for fun. So intussusceptions. Hey, let's finish this segment with some of the more common neoplasms of the gastrointestinal tube. And this is a very common neoplasm in the dog. It is not a difficult diagnosis because of the amount of pigment and more importantly, the tooth loss. A couple good rules for looking at benign versus malignant neoplasms in the dog. And if you see tooth loss, it's usually a malignant neoplasm. About 100% of these are malignant. They're often seen in animals which normally have a lot of pigment in their mouth, including Scottish Terriers, Airedales, Cockers, Bedlington Terriers, Chows, Golden Retrievers. So uh, there's a lot of literature out there on oral melanoma but if it's affecting the oral mucosa or the toe of the dog, usually the prognosis is much worse than those which affect the skin. Here's a nice picture. Look, the tooth is there. I'm thinking benign, and, and uh, this is a, a uh, epulis. It's gone through a number of names. We used to call them fib fibrous and ossifying. And then they were called... Uh, fibromus epulides of the periodontal ligament. And now we call them peripheral odontogenic fibromas, but they are benign tumors. Epulides tend to have a very granular appearance to them. And even though they may be large and affect, mul affect multiple teeth, um, they don't invade and they don't result in tooth loss, but they do arise from the periodontal ligament. Another neoplasm, which used to be included in the Apulides, and you can see that granular nature that we like to see with Epulis, but there is tooth loss here, is what used to be called an acanthomous Epulis, now is referred to as an acanthomous ameloblastoma. These 
neoplasms are common in brachycephalic braids. They probably arise from residue of the enamel organ. So you will see very classic columnar cells around the edges of the neoplasm. The palisade, they line up. They may have thin or broad trabeculae, and they burrow down into the bone, resulting in tooth loss and often pathologic fracture. Very rarely, these may transform to squamous cell carcinoma. In a lot of these, you will see uh, areas that look very squamous, a uh, formation of uh, almost keratin pearls, and uh, but, but look at it very closely and examine the deep border. Um, and if you see a wide border with palisading um, cells, you want to think about ameloblastoma. Muscles, uh, smooth muscle tumors of the GI tract are common as are smooth muscle tumors of the reproductive tract. Um, about 20 years ago, the first diagnosis of a gastrointestinal stromal tumor was made, um, which probably throws a lot of the historical diagnoses of lyomyomas in doubt because the two can look almost identical. There are some, some very broad ground rules which do not preclude you in my opinion, from running immunohistochemical stains. Um, lyomyomas tend to resemble smooth muscles. GI, uh, GIS can resemble smooth muscle tumors, or they can resemble uh, tumors of the nervous system. Um, lyomyomas tend to be a little more proximal in the esophagus and stomach, with more GISTs in the intestine or colon. The GIST arises from the interstitial cells of Cajal, as we said before, they can have a variety of patterns, including resembling smooth muscle, the neurogenic form, which looks like, under the microscope, like a nerve sheath tumor, the very rare myxoid variant, or, or some that may have a few or be very undifferentiated. Um, gists often tend to grow outward. Um, toward the serosal surface of the gut, whereas lyomyomas often tend to, to grow inward, as in this case. And uh, gists may also result in perineoplastic syndromes as a result of liberation of insulin-like growth factors. So um, with these particular tumors, I always run the immuno, the appropriate immuno would be C-kit, which is usually quite positive in the gastrointestinal stromal tumors or GIST. Oh, here's a lovely picture. We're up close. We are very personal with the gastric mucosa. You can see the rugae, and a lot of them are extremely expanded by an infiltration of white cells. And this is what lymphoma looks like in the dog. Prime, they are primary lymphomas usually seen in, in males. Most commonly, you know, if we look at the GI tract, um, the tumors of the small intestine far outweigh those of the stomach and the colon. They are often uh, epitheliotropic or T-cell uh, lymphoma in the intestine, but lymphoma of the GI tract, the dog is a well-known and well-studied entity. And if you're not familiar with the literature, you probably want to look at it because there's been a lot of work done on those in the last 10 years. Here's a huge tumor, often near the pylorus of the stomach. This is a gastro, uh, gastric adenocarcinoma. Um, these tend to metastasize wide prior to surgical attempts. And there's a couple of things going on that you want to notice on this particular one. Gastric adenocarcinomas often result in marked thickening of the mucosa due to the marked desmoplastic response or, or the laying down of fibrous connective tissue, which is accompanies these particular tumors. Um, this has been, been uh, called a, the leather bottle appearance or linitis plastica. It's just a profound desmoplastic response accompanying 
gastric carcinomas. And because gastric carcinomas replace the normal mucous neck cells with a population of disorganized, undifferentiated cells which don't make mucus, they often are accompanied with large areas of ulceration. And then if you look closely, you'll see these big, broad um, rugae, which have developed as a result of uh, impaired gastric outflow. So a number of secondary changes to the gastric adenocarcinoma, and it is one of the more common, aside from lymphoma, sites of, uh, of tumors in the GI tract of the dog. And here's one more. I just found this the other day, and it's just such a great picture. I had to throw it in there, and it's really a mesenteric disease. It's a disease of the abdomen, and these um, at uh, when the animal was opened up due to vague GI signs, but G, but abdominal swelling. These are huge numbers of tapeworm larva, mesocystoides, and dogs are one of the species that will get an abdominal mesocystoides infection. And people that have seen these surgically, when they look into the abdomen, they say it's like moving tapioca pudding. It's a rare condition, rare, a rare form of tapeworm infection that affects the abdominal cavity of the dog. But it's such a great picture that uh, by Dr. Kershaw that I wanted to uh, to put that in here. Well, I'm just about to hit an hour, and I think this lecture has gone on long enough. As I said before, um, I think there's even more dog in the series on the GI tract, but that is probably an eight-hour lecture series in itself. So go view that if you are so desirous. Otherwise, um, we're going to come back with uh, lecture number five and talk about liver and pancreatic disease in the dog. So until that time, I wish you good health and a fantastic day.